Gaude amus omnes in domino. I am going in the way of the fathers, for I see myself being summoned by the Lord. Sanctorum Omnium. Welcome to The Way of the Fathers, a podcast sponsored by CatholicCulture.org. I'm your host, Mike Aquilina. Today we're going to meet one of the most mysterious and exotic of the Church Fathers, Afrahat, the Persian sage. Since the beginning of this series, we've remained mostly within the borders of the Roman Empire. We've encountered fathers who wrote in Greek and others who wrote in Latin. We've studied a few in the Egyptian countryside who spoke Coptic, and there were others who spoke Armenian. But all the fathers we've discussed so far were Roman subjects, whether they were happy about that fact or not. The Roman Empire was vast. It stretched from Great Britain to Egypt, from Morocco to Georgia. But it wasn't the only empire on earth, and it wasn't the only place where Christians lived. Far beyond the borders was India, with whom Rome enjoyed brisk relations in trade and diplomacy. More remote, both geographically and diplomatically, was China during its Han Dynasty and Six Dynasties period. Closer to home, and too close for comfort, was the Persian Empire, Rome's arch-rival in the 3rd and 4th centuries. The territories ruled by the Persians included modern-day Iran, Iraq, Armenia, Georgia, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and western India. Rome suffered humiliating defeats at the hands of Persia's Sassanid rulers. In 260, the Roman Emperor Valerian was captured in battle and used as a footstool by the Persian Emperor Shapur I. When Shapur tired of this arrangement, he had Valerian killed and his body stuffed for public display. Jewish communities had flourished in Persian lands for almost a thousand years. They were well established and enjoyed special favor from the Sassanids. It was in these lands that the great Babylonian Talmud was produced over the course of centuries. And it was probably within those Jewish communities that the first Persian Christians emerged. Those origins are lost to history. We know almost nothing about Christian activity in Persian lands in the 1st, 2nd, or 3rd centuries. Then suddenly, in the 4th century, the Persian church appears in the records, but not as something new or dependent on missionaries from the West. It is fully formed, distinctive, sophisticated, with its own cultural markers, its own patterns of thought, and its own apologetic concerns. It even had its own language, which was unrelated to Greek or Latin. It was rather a close kin of Hebrew, the language of the Old Testament, and Aramaic, the language spoken by Jesus and the apostles. The language of the Persian church was called Syriac, and so the fathers of that church are traditionally called the Syriac Fathers. From its beginnings, Syriac Christianity felt different from its Greek and Roman counterparts. And the first Syriac writer to make an impression on those counterparts was Afrahat, the Persian sage. In his small corpus of writings, Afrahat tells us almost everything we know about both Judaism and Christianity in the Sassanid Empire of his time. And yet he tells us very little about his own life. He gives the entirety of his attention to the interpretation of the gospel for both his friendly neighbors and his hostile neighbors. Afrahat was probably born around 280 A.D. From his name and from some evidence within his writings, it seems that he was born into a traditional Persian family and spent his young life practicing the official religion, which was Zoroastrianism. During his young adulthood, he would have been well aware of the rivalry between the two great empires. The Romans appeared to gain strength as they returned to rule by a single emperor, That lone emperor, named Constantine, also caused a stir when he recognized Christianity as a legal religion. Constantine's Rome was the first world power to do that. But Afrahat was not living in Roman territory. 
and in Persia, Christianity was still fiercely persecuted. Nevertheless, he converted to Christianity. We don't know anything about the circumstances. All we know is that he took the name James upon his baptism, and he likely affiliated himself with a religious group called the Sons of the Covenant. It would have been a brave move. The Sassanids had never been friendly to Christianity. They tried mightily to unify their people in a common religion, Zoroastrianism, and they punished deviations rather severely. It was Persians, after all, who taught the rest of the world how to crucify men. The Sassanids made an exception for the Jews because of their long-standing residence in the lands, but the exception did not extend to Christians. Constantine's embrace of the church only made matters worse for Persian Christians. Now they were viewed as a fifth column in their native land. Constantine further aggravated the situation by writing to the Persian emperor Shapur and speaking to him on behalf of Christians who were Persian subjects. He said to his enemy, quote, Imagine then with what joy I heard tidings so accordant with my desire that the fairest districts of Persia are filled with those men on whose behalf alone I am presently speaking. I mean the Christians. I pray, therefore, that both you and they may enjoy abundant prosperity. Unquote. Shapur responded by imposing a double tax on all his Christian subjects. He ordered his military leaders to arrest the Syriac patriarch and force him to cooperate with the collection of the tax. Why? He made his reason plain. Because, quote, they inhabit our territory and agree with Caesar, our enemy, unquote. Shapur intended to wage war on Rome and force the Christians to fund the campaign. The Christians refused, and so they were made to suffer. Shapur oversaw persecution on a grand scale. The 5th century historian Sazaman tells us the number of men and women whose names have been ascertained and who were martyred at this period has been computed to be upwards of 16,000, while the multitude of martyrs whose names are unknown was so great that the Persians, the Syrians, and the inhabitants of Edessa have failed in all their efforts to compute the number. All of this is backdrop to the work of Afrahat the Persian sage. By his conversion, he had relinquished his privileged status and assumed a place among the empire's outliers and outcasts. All we know of him is a single literary work titled The Demonstrations. It consists of 23 meditations, each on a different subject. All but the last one are arranged in alphabetical order based on the first letter of the first word in the unit. Thus, demonstrations 1 through 22 correspond to the 22 letters of the Syriac alphabet. The concluding meditation falls outside the system. Afrahat dates the demonstrations precisely, so we know they were composed in three distinct periods. Numbers 1 through 10 he set down in 337 AD. Numbers 11 through 22 he wrote in the year 344 when Shapur's persecution was most intense. He added the 23rd demonstration in the year 347. The first ten demonstrations lay out the basics of Christian doctrine and practice. The next twelve address matters of immediate contemporary concern to the Church. So the series covers a wide range of topics. Faith, charity, fasting, prayer, war, penance, humility, the work of the clergy, almsgiving, celibacy, and death. Several of the later demonstrations are direct and detailed responses to Jewish challenges to Christian claims. In one, he relates an anecdote, quote, It happened one day that a man who is called the sage of the Jews asked me, saying, Jesus, who was called your teacher, wrote for you, If there shall be faith in you like a single grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move, and it will move away from before you, and even be lifted up and fall into the sea, for it shall obey you. Thus there is in all your people 
not one wise man whose prayer is heard, who asks of God that your persecutions should cease from you. For it is written thus for you in a text that there is nothing which you shall not be able to do. Unquote. The sage of the Jews was hitting Afrahat at the church's most sensitive and vulnerable point. If the Christians were right and the Jews were wrong, why was God ignoring the pleas of the church while seeming to protect the Jews in Persia? Afrahat takes the charge very seriously and responds by reviewing the history of Israel as it appears in the Old Testament. He shows that in every age, the righteous had endured persecution and suffering. Joseph, Moses, Joshua, David, Elijah, Elisha, and so on through the Maccabees. Individual heroes suffered, and the nation suffered as a whole through enslavement, defeat, and exile. All of these persecutions prefigured the life of Jesus. Jesus fulfilled these ancient types, and he now served as a model for Christian martyrs. It is curious that Afrahat never engages in dialogue with the Zoroastrian religion. Perhaps he didn't want to provoke the ruling classes any further. Yet everywhere in the demonstrations, he shows a profound understanding of Jewish customs and biblical interpretation. This is remarkable and rather unique among the church fathers. Afrahat was an active participant in a passionate dispute about the most important matters in life. But he didn't resort to caricature. He didn't allow bitterness or uncharity to color his argument. Instead, he strove to build his case from authorities that both Christians and Jews held in common. He appealed consistently and exhaustively to the scriptures of the Old Testament. Scholars today note that in his biblical exegesis, Afrahat only rarely resorted to allegory. Very rarely. He preferred history, the common history that neither his co-religionists nor his interlocutors would dare contest. In this, he has been singled out as a model for Jewish-Christian dialogue. The modern Jewish scholar Jacob Nussner wrote a book about Afrahat and translated some of the demonstrations into English. Nussner called Afrahat remarkable and exemplary. He added, moreover, that the Persian sage even today stands as, quote, an enduring voice of civility and rationality amid the cacophony of mutual disesteem that marred Jewish-Christian relations in the first millennium. Afrahat gives us the distinct impression that, in Persia at least, the everyday relationship between the two communities was vigorous, intimate, and competitive. So says Jacob Nussner. But it was never acrimonious, or so it seems. Afrahat's immediate audience for the demonstrations was his fellow members of the Sons of the Covenant. They were ascetics who shared a common life of prayer, study, and charitable service. Modern scholars speculate that the Sons of the Covenant may have emerged from the same biblical tradition that produced the early Jewish covenanters at Qumran the community that produced the Dead Sea Scrolls. They share many similarities, not least their common emphasis on ascetical practices such as celibacy and fasting. Afrahad addressed the community from a position of authority. In two places, he seems to speak on behalf of a local synod of bishops. Thus, many readers in antiquity and in modern times have believed him to be a bishop. That's possible, though not certain. His authority may have come from his own ascetical life, for which he was renowned, and his erudition and eloquence. He wrote in prose that used all the techniques of poetry, rich imagery, metaphor, parable, parallelism, thesis and antithesis. He knew how to make his point. Listen as he exalts the life of vowed poverty over the enjoyment of wealth. The drink of the poor is water and he is satisfied. The rich man drinks aged wine and still thirsts. The sleep of all the avaricious is scared away. The lying down of poverty is still and quiet. The poor thinks how to break his bread for the needy. The rich thinks how to devour him who is less than him. Afrahat returned repeatedly to certain favorite themes, including humility and love. 
If Christians were now humiliated in persecution, he asked, perhaps it was God's way of bringing them to repentance. He says, we are plundered, persecuted, and scattered. Because we hated one another, many are those who hated us without a cause. Because we insulted, we were insulted. Because we despised, we were despised. Because we deceived, we were deceived. Because we became exalted, we were humbled. Because we oppressed, we were oppressed. Because we overpowered, we were overpowered. The Persian sage exhorts his community to take up the practice of charity, unstintingly, unceasingly. He says, Love conceals hateful things. Love blots out sins. Love is far away from boasting. Love refrains from pride. Love withdraws from strife. Love is exalted above jealousy. Love is lifted from division. Love is a stranger to avarice. Love is a foreigner to mocking. Love escapes from evil. For the fruits of love are beloved, desirable, honorable, and fair. Love preserved Noah from the flood, and it delivered Rahab from the sword of Joshua. It exalted David and blotted out his sins. Afrahat makes clear that only the witness of love can convert the heathen and move the hearts of the church's persecutors. Thus he delivers a forceful exhortation to the church's pastors. O oh, shepherd who does not understand his honor, how will you teach me humility when you are exalted, proud, and haughty? How will you teach me love one another when you are full of hatred and anger? How will you teach me be chaste when you are licentious, babbling, and boasting? How will you teach me leave this world when you are fallen into its midst and drowned? How will you teach me give relief to the poor when you persecute the poor, your fellow human beings? How will you teach me let go of what is in your heart when you have old leaven stored up in you? How will you teach me make peace with your brother when you bring the whole world into confusion? In his 23 demonstrations, Afrahat gives us a glimpse of a lost world, a crucial stage in the development of the church. In the work of this Persian Christian, we see early Christianity, isolated from Roman and Greek influence, purely Semitic, and very clearly in continuity with its Jewish roots. Indeed, in constant dialogue with living Judaism, Syriac Christianity enters our historical record with Afrahat. And it continues to develop from that moment to our own day. The tradition lives still today in the churches that observe the Chaldean, Malabar, and Malankar rites. In our next episode, we'll encounter the greatest of the Syriac fathers, a man of singular genius, Ephraim the deacon. Afrahat vanished from the scene, and the only trace he left was his demonstrations. We have no idea how or when he died but he has been venerated as a sage and a saint since the 4th century, and his great work was soon translated into the Western languages. I cannot claim anything like Afrahat's level of greatness. But before you go, I want to ask you a favor. I want to ask you not to let this podcast fade away, as Afrahat did. We still have much work to do and centuries to cover, and that takes time, and it costs money. This year has been hard on us as it's been on everyone. Charitable giving always declines in the year of a presidential election, and everything declined during the COVID-19 pandemic. But a generous donor has come forward and offered to help us through by matching any and all donations up to $100,000. So anything you send our way will bless us twice. This offer extends only till December 8, 2020. So please help us out. Please go now to our donation form at catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio. De quorum solemnitate gaudentangeli et collaudant fili
Way of the Fathers is just one of the podcasts produced by CatholicCulture.org. To hear more from the Church Fathers in their own words, check out Catholic Culture audiobooks, readings of Catholic classics, including the Fathers and St. John Henry Newman. You might also enjoy Criteria, the Catholic film podcast. It's a film club devoted to works of high artistic caliber and Catholic interest. And for interviews on a wide range of topics in Catholic arts and culture, listen to the Catholic Culture Podcast.